hear God's word for us this morning from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Jesus said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The word of God for the people of God. All right, well, I'm so glad you're here this morning as we are wrapping up our series called We Are the Church. So in this series, we've been talking about who we are as a church and, and what God is calling us to do and who he is calling us to be. Uh, I'm excited about this opportunity that we've had to share these new uh, mission, vision, and values. These are all so important. Keeping all of this in mind is, is going to help us to all be pulling in the same direction, in the direction that God wants us to go so that we can stay right in the center of God's will for us as a church. The image that's been coming to mind to me through this uh, series is that of a, a drag racer. You know those long cars, the really long ones, and they're skinny, and the little wheels in the front, the big wheels in the back, and the huge motor back there. And I feel like over the past couple of years, we've been pulling the car onto the track and we've been fueling it up. And in the past couple of months, we've been kind of orienting it, making sure it's pointed in the right direction. And these three sermons are red light, yellow light, green light. And now it's time for God to step on the gas. All right. I'm looking forward. To, yeah. Hey, we, we'll, we'll get excited about that. That's what God, God is doing in this place. And uh, it's been awesome to hear over the past couple of weeks some feedback from you all about how God is like stepping on the gas in your life already. Uh, I mentioned the idea of the A-team a couple of weeks ago, uh, a group of folks who can go out and maybe do some things at people's houses that they can't do for themselves anymore. And I've had folks on both sides of the equation come up and talk to me about how excited they are. We've had people that come up and say, oh, I'm so glad we're doing something in the community. Put my name down. I'm ready to get started. And we've had other people who have said, yeah, I don't have a ladder and my light has been out for like a year. And so people on both sides of the equation ready for all of that. Uh, you got a chance earlier in the service to meet Anna. Uh, Beth Ann put down such a great foundation, and now it's time to have someone who is solely devoted to the students in our church, in our community. And, and that ministry is, is growing. Anna hasn't even started yet. She starts uh, tomorrow officially, but we had five new students show up to youth group last week. And yeah, that, that, was, that was great. It was neat to see. Uh, we have families moving in. It was neat to hear the stories. I got to actually meet a couple of the families today. Um, and uh, so we have families moving into this community. And now Beth Ann is going to be able to do more of kind of that big picture work that she was originally hired to do, devoting time to parents and families, connecting with the schools. I'm excited about what God is doing around here and what he continues to have in store for us. So what is it that we've covered over these last couple of weeks so far in this series? If you missed either of the, uh, of the past weeks, I, I just really encourage you to get online, our website, our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, and watch them. And I think these are so important that if you can't access any of those, you just come and talk to me and I will preach it to your face. Okay, so, so I'll just come one-on-one -on -one and I'll just tell you what we've been talking about. So, um, so two weeks ago, we talked about our core values. Those are the things that make us who we are. Okay, they are our foundation. They are our starting point. And so let's be reminded of what those are. Let's say those together. The first and foremost, we are. We have a high value of. And we are a. All right. Everything that we do around here centers around Jesus. We, we have a high traditional view of Scripture. We walk this journey in community. Following Jesus is not a solo sport. We need each other. And one of the things that we do together is we serve. G Jesus set the example of service, and so we need to do the same. We serve here at church, and we serve out in the community as well. So, so our values are where we start, and where we are headed is reflected in our vision statement. This is kind of the preferred reality that we are moving towards, uh, that we are called to by God. And that is, let's read this out loud together. Ready? Here we go. Making disciples of Jesus Christ who worship passionately, love extravagantly, and witness boldly. Jesus calls us to be and to make disciples. 
And we're going to talk more about that today. But, but we want to be disciples who worship with our whole hearts, that, that, we, that we love above and beyond, and that we're always ready to share what God is doing in our lives. So, so that's, that's the direction we're headed. But what are we going to look like in the in-between time? How are we going to, to live that out? What environment are we going to create here so that we can most effectively make disciples of Jesus? Well, that's our mission. Let's read this one out loud together. Ready? Here we go. We welcome all, love all, and serve all so that we all may be transformed by Christ. That's who we want to be. We want to be about others. We want to welcome them. We want to love them. We want to serve them. And in doing so, they're going to be transformed. But let me let you in on a little secret. In doing that, we ourselves will be transformed. We, we've talked a lot through this series about the importance of being disciples, um, the importance of making disciples. But how do we do it? What's, what's the path that we can follow to, to be a disciple? The good news is, is that there's not just one way to do it, okay? It's not just follow simple A, B, C, D, and you're there. Um, it's like the story of Miss Jones. Uh, she lived next door to a church, and she did not like it, okay? It was too loud, too many people. And uh, one, one night they were having a, a revival and they were particularly rowdy and Miss Jones had had enough. And so it was dark outside, but Miss Jones walked over there because she was going to give them a piece of her mind. Okay? As she approached the building in the dark, though, she didn't see the hole that had been dug outside one of the windows. And boom, she fell right in. Couldn't get out. Stuck in that hole. She was stuck, and, and no one could hear her because the music was so loud, and, and it just kept going and going. And then finally, the preacher started preaching, and something happened. And Mrs. Jones heard about Jesus and how much that he loved her, and, and she prayed along with him, and she prayed to receive Jesus, and she turned her heart over to him. And she was so excited over the next little while. She wanted to make sure that everyone had that same kind of warm experience that she had, so she ran around pushing people into holes. Not everyone's going to have the same experience, okay? What, what works for you isn't necessarily going to work for me. What works for me isn't necessarily going to work for you. So this discipleship path that we're looking at today is not etched in stone. There, there may be people who enter the journey at different places. Uh, we're going to have folks that walk the path at different paces. And, and there may be some little side trips that go on, but, but we all still want to be moving towards Jesus. So it's not going to be a cookie-cutter process, but we have to have a process. It's not something that we can leave to random chance and hope that maybe someday we accidentally make a disciple. Okay, we want to be intentional about it. We always want to be looking for what our next step is, and we also want to be looking around to see how we can help someone else take their next step also. So let's start with the first part of our discipleship path, and that is engage. Let me hear you say engage. The engaged step is where we and others discover Christ. Now, to give you a little bit of clarity on this, do you notice in the picture, are the people inside the circle or outside the circle? They're outside the circle. Okay, so this is where we connect with people where they are. Okay, we don't just sit back inside these walls and wait for people to come to us. All right, we want to engage. This, this is where it starts. We are part of people uh, discovering Jesus. Maybe you've had a chance encounter with someone that has ended up kind of maybe shifting your perspective on something. That's what happens when we truly engage Jesus. It's a moment of realization that Jesus is not just some historical figure, but he is alive and active and can make a difference in our lives. Think about the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Um, he, he had heard this hubbub out in the city and, and wanted to see what was going on, but he was a wee little man. And, uh, and so he couldn't, he, couldn't get to, he couldn't see what was happening. So his curiosity led him to climb a tree so he could finally see what happened, what was going on. And his curiosity led him to a life-changing encounter. Jesus noticed him, called him by name, and transformed his life. That's what engagement with Jesus does. It transforms us inside and out. We, we all need to engage with Jesus. And honestly, the first place isn't necessarily always going to be the church. It could be in conversations at the softball field. 
I remember when I first started as a pastor, I was an associate at Christ Church in Venice, and one of the guys invited me to play on his uh, City League softball team, and I said, I will, but under one condition, don't tell him I'm a pastor. Because if you tell him I'm a pastor, it just changes everything. They, they, you, they, everyone just gets all holy around you. Um, I wanted to get to know them as, as real people, and so we did, and we played for, for a month, and, and no one knew, and finally, eventually, of course, they found out I was a pastor, so of course, then they all started calling me Padre, but, but we would just sit around in the parking lot after games and, and, and talk, talk about life, and, and they would get a chance to hear kind of a perspective from, from someone who follows Jesus, and, and so it was, a, it was a good interaction. It helped them to engage with Jesus out where they were in the parking lot of the softball field. It could be maybe in doing an act of kindness for someone. It could be interactions with your neighbors. God has a million ways that he reaches out to connect with us and to help us to get to know him. So once we've engaged with Jesus, then we move to relate. Let me hear you say relate. This step is all about discovering and building community within the body of Christ. Again, discipleship is not a solitary journey. It's meant to be lived out in the context of relationships. In the early church, as, they, as we read about in Acts chapter 2, the believers didn't just gather to worship together on Sunday morning. They did life together. They shared meals and they prayed for each other and supported each other in, in, in profound ways. Their, their community wasn't just a backdrop for their faith. It was a vibrant expression of their faith. The relate step of discipleship means finding a group of people with whom you can share your life, your struggles, your victories, your journey with Jesus. It's in these relationships that we find um, encouragement and accountability and the opportunity to grow together. Community isn't just a, a nice idea. It's a fundamental part of our spiritual growth. Uh, I've it's important for us to get connected in, in like different small groups, men's groups, women's groups, the different Bible studies that go on. Maybe, maybe you even just want to start a band of, of people. Uh, I'm a part of a couple different bands. I've told you before with, uh, that I meet with three other people a couple times a month that we get on a Zoom call and we just talk about how life is going, what, how it is with our soul, and, and what are some things that maybe we need to, to work on. So there's accountability and growth all mixed in there, and maybe that's something you want to start with a few folks here locally. And this is also, this relate step is also why we talk so much about the importance of creating a welcoming environment here. We want everyone who walks through these doors to know that there's a place for them around the family table. All right, so let's talk about the next step then. It's equip. Let me hear you say equip. This step is all about discovering and developing our character. It's not enough to just have an encounter with Jesus and be part of a community. We need to grow into the people that God wants us to be. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, it says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. And as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So in this section, the Apostle Paul is describing how God gave all of us gifts to equip us for ministry. These gifts help us to grow into maturity. Think of it like this. You're a, you're a new employee at a company. You don't just jump right in and start working. There's, there's training that you have to do. You have to get prepared. In the same way as, as disciples of Jesus, it's not just about acquiring knowledge. We need to be equipped and trained to reflect the character of Christ in our lives, to be able to reflect his love and his patience his humility. This process involves studying scripture, doing spiritual disciplines, 
allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. It's a continual process of growth and refinement. Our character is shaped as we allow God to work in us, making us more like Jesus. And as we grow, then we're just better equipped to be able to handle the challenges and the opportunities that we encounter in our lives. And, but we have to remember this is a process. Think, think, I always think of a, sculpture, a, a sculptor in this with the big block of marble there and just chipping away a little bit at a time. You know, it, sometimes it's a meticulous process. Sometimes for us on the, on the chiseling end, it's a, it can be a little painful. But the end result is a masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. God, the master craftsman, works in us, chiseling away the rough edges and shaping us to reflect his image. And finally then, the fourth step is we come to send. Let me hear you say send. This step is about discovering our calling and being commissioned to act on it. Our engagement with Jesus, our relationships and community, our development and character all lead to this moment where we're sent out to fulfill our purpose in God's plan. Like we read earlier, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is not just a call to a few. This is a mission that has been given to all of us as followers of Jesus. It doesn't say, hey, pastors, this is for you. It's for all of us. Your calling might be in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your school, whatever your sphere of influence may be. It's where your passions and gifts and opportunities intersect with the needs of the world. The disciples, Jesus' disciples, were sent out to the world to make a difference. They weren't just sent out to, to do a job. They were sent with a purpose to spread the message of Jesus and to transform the world. In the same way, you are sent with a calling that matters. You're not just going through life aimlessly. God has a purpose for you. And and as you step into your calling, you have the opportunity to become something bigger than yourself, making a difference in ways that you never would have imagined. Now let's see how all of this kind of fits together. So so it's, it's kind of a circular path as well because the disciples who are sent, then they're out there engaging with people in the community, helping them to encounter Jesus. And, and, then they, and then those people get to start walking on this path. And the cycle continues. Again, like we talked about last week, we want to be disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Those are the laps around the path here. By being intentional about a discipleship path, we can have some clarity as to how we make disciples. We can look at our ministries and see where things fit. We, we can see how we're doing in certain areas that maybe, hey, maybe we don't have a lot of uh, new people coming to visit. Well, maybe we need to do something to improve our engage aspect. How, how can we connect with the community better? Maybe, maybe there, we don't feel folks feeling welcome here. What can we do to relate? We need to offer more small groups, things like that. What do we need to do to, to, crank, up, to crank it up a notch in those different areas? But again, all this is not just black and white. Take the rummage sale, for example. It's partially used for engage because it's a non-threatening way to get people on our campus and they get to interact with Jesus-filled folks. Kind of fits the definition of engage. But it's also relate because it's a great place for folks who are new to church to get to know other folks and, and work side by side. There are some of you who have worked at the rummage sale for years and you've worked in the same department for 12 years with the same people. And so you have this connection and relationship. But it's also a sin because I know that there are some folks that take very seriously the outreach and witnessing angle of the, of the sale, that, that it's their calling to have conversations with folks and invite them to come to church. So many folks who attend here are, are here because they attended the rummage sale and they were invited to come to church. So part of your sin might be to engage, to connect with people in your community and and show them the love of Jesus. Maybe some of your sin is to relate. 
And, and maybe your calling is to be some of those folks I talked about in the first week who are intentionally walking around and looking around for people that they don't know to get a chance to introduce themselves and to, to welcome them here. Part of your send might be to equip. Maybe you can facilitate a group. We're, we're working on developing training classes for each of those steps along the way, and we're going to need people to lead them. If you can't tell... I'm really excited about this path that God has us on at Englewood Methodist Church. We have our marching orders from God. We know the direction that we need to go. So let's all pull in the same direction. Let's get rid of distractions. Let's get excited and pray and give and love and welcome, serve and grow as a disciple. And God will transform us and God will transform our community. And so to go back to the race car analogy from earlier, ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this time together today. I thank you for this call that you have given us, this way that we can live out being a disciple. God, we know that, that you are in the midst of doing something amazing in this community and, and transforming it for you and for your purpose. And so, God, help us to be a part of that. We know there's so many people moving to this area and, and just so many people who have even been in this area for a long time who don't know you. And we want to be a part of helping them to engage with you, to discover who you are, and, and that you can transform their lives. And so, God, help us to know how we fit into that plan. And not just a generic us as a church but God, you have a calling for each and every one of us. God, don't let us give in to the, to the lie that tells us that, that we don't have anything to offer, that we're not worth anything, that we're not part of it, because that's all a lie. God, help us to hear your truth, that we are your masterpiece, and that you have things set aside for us to do from the foundation of the world. So God, speak to us, guide us, direct us. We thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're, we've come to the time in the service. The ushers are ready to come through with the offering plates. Um, if you're watching online and, uh, and you'd like to give, you can give through the app or through the website. Uh, for us here, the ushers are going to come through. This is also the time that we turn in those green cards. You can place those in the plates as well. So ushers, please come forward for this morning's offering.